Thank you very much, Taf, for that really nice uh, introduction, and good evening, everybody. Uh, we had an exciting start to our trip today. My wife and I traveled uh, here from California. We were supposed to arrive at noon, uh, which would have given me time to freshen up and change into my Aloha shirts. I brought five. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, the flight was delayed, and uh, worse than that, we had to change planes, and so we got here just in time for tonight's lecture. <laughs> so forgive the uh, non-Hawaiian appearance. Okay, uh, you may see that I added a tiny little subtitle uh, to the main title, Looking Back in Time. And you'll see there's a couple of themes hidden in, in those four words. Looking back in time is one of the things that we do because you'll see that the power of MOSFIRE is that it allows us to look back in time at some of the very first galaxies ever to form in the universe. But in some ways, this is also a walk down memory lane for me because, as Taf said, I got my undergraduate degree in 1971 and my PhD in 1974, so I'm rapidly coming up on a 40-year career during which I have done nothing much other than build instruments to facilitate new kinds of measurements uh, in astronomy. So let me begin. I want to start right away by acknowledging the fantastic team of people that worked on MOSFIRE. It, it was a multi-year, actually about eight years, from concept to handover to the observatory, ready for science. Multi-institutional, UCLA, Caltech, University of California at Santa Cruz, and of course the staff here at the WM Keck Observatory. But there were also a lot of subcontracts, major subcontracts to industry, and we want to pick out, in particular, uh, the Swiss Center for Electronics and Microtechnology. You'll see their name come up later. This $14 million instrument would simply not have happened was it not for the fantastic team effort of all these people. No one person can build a modern scientific instrument anymore. It requires a skilled team. Uh, but it also requires money. And funding was provided by the Telescope System Instrumentation Program, operated by the National Science Foundation, and by a very generous donation from our good friends Gordon and Betty Moore. So you, uh, Taft already mentioned uh, my colleague, Chuck Stidell. You see I put both our names in bold there, uh, just to indicate that we were the two senior astronomers uh, on this team. And, uh, we represented different institutions fiscally, and so there were contracts to UCLA and contracts to Caltech. But we also had jobs. Uh, so Chuck was the project scientist, so his goal was to make sure that whatever I tried to do to stay on budget and on schedule did not compromise the science. And my job was to stay on budget and schedule. And so I would do anything to stay on budget and schedule. Uh, but Chuck and I were always on the same page. And so we ended up delivering an instrument to Keck that actually had more features than originally in the proposal. So we certainly did not de-scope. So here is MOSFIRE. It's this thing hanging from the ceiling. That's a scary moment as you see the instrument lifted from the ground up into, onto the deck, ready to go into the telescope. That's the telescope, the back of the telescope right there. So that's what MOSFIRE looks like. You can get some, some idea of scale there. It's about four tons. And here's me standing alongside it, which helps to establish the scale as well. And it's cold up there, so you can see I'm well padded. Uh, and that really is padding, that's not really me. That... Okay, but what is it? That's what it looks like, but what is it? So let me explain what it does. And actually, uh, someone, or was it Carol, I think, at uh, dinner, uh, mentioned how does it take pictures? Because the name MOSFIRE stands for Multi Object Spectrometer for Infrared exploration, IR exploration. But actually the instrument, so that implies that it's a spectrograph, but actually we did an amazing thing. We made an infrared camera and a spectrometer in one instrument. That's actually quite challenging to do. So in fact, the way this instrument works is that it takes an infrared picture first, 
uh, quite a decent field of view for such a large telescope, about, uh, about one-fifth of the uh, diameter of the moon. And then within that green rectangle, you can isolate individual objects using what we call a slit mask. So you can see lots of tiny little slits, and they're not just random, they're actually isolating individual faint, very distant galaxies. And then finally, for every one of those slits, and you can get up to 46 of them, you take the spectrum of all of those objects at the same time, absolutely simultaneously. So that's a huge increase in efficiency, not one spectrum, but up to 46 spectrums. This pattern of slits is completely reconfigurable in about six minutes. So that's actually what MOSFIRE does. So from that, you could see that what we really should have called it is the multi-object spectrometer and imager for infrared explanation. But that would have been MOSIFIRE, and we didn't like that as much as MOSFIRE. OK, so here's a picture of uh, MOSFIRE again up at the telescope. Uh, and this is uh, one of the Keck astronomers here, Mark Cassis, who's in the audience right now. And you can see, what you can see here is only the outside of the instrument. Most of it is this blue chamber. Uh, there's some electronics at the back. There's a guide camera at the front. And then this large piece here is what enables us to bolt into the telescope and actually rotate the instrument. But I'll explain why we need to rotate the instrument in a little while. So what's actually inside it? A lot of stuff. It's really quite complicated inside. And in order to understand all that's in here, uh, you need to go back a little bit and just think about what it means to build an infrared instrument. In fact, really the story doesn't even begin there. We have to go a little further back in time and talk about infrared in general. So let's start here. I'll pretend you're my physics 6C uh, class today, and I'll tell you about light. So light, as we all know, is the cosmic messenger. That's the only source of information that we have from distant sources. It's a radiant form of energy, and Isaac Newton showed us that if you pass a sliver of light through a slit and then through a glass prism, it will disperse itself into a rainbow of colors. And this is the well-known colors um, from blue to red. But actually, this sample is only a tiny fraction of all the forms of light that are actually out there. There are forms of light that our eyes simply cannot see. And one of those forms of light was discovered around the year 1800 by this man, Sir William Herschel. You know Sir William Herschel because just 19 years before that, he discovered the planet that we now know as Uranus. And this experiment, which is shown here pictorially, occurred some 65 years before that very famous Scottish physicist, James Clark Maxwell. And by the way, if you hadn't detected it earlier, you probably now realize I have a Scottish accent. You couldn't tell, I know. <laughs> so what Herschel did was repeat Newton's experiment, but in a very clever way. So he has a slit here in his, win uh, his uh, window shade, and he's letting some light from the sun come through. It goes through a prism, splits up into the colors of the rainbow. But just beyond the red end, you can see he's set up a very elegant experiment here. What he has is a thermometer. And the thermometer, one of the thermometers, is sitting near to the red light, but clearly beyond where the red light stops, as far as your eye can tell. And what he noticed was that that thermometer got warm. It heated up, which means that it was absorbing radiant energy, even though he couldn't see that energy with his eye. And just as a, to be a good scientist, there were two other thermometers that were not in the the spectrum at all, and they didn't change temperature. So he had just discovered what he called calorific rays, rays that heat things up. We now call them infrared rays or infrared light. Herschel was prolific. Remember, this is before the invention of photography, so everything that he saw in the sky, he was sketching. Actually, his sister was doing a lot of the sketching, and he was doing the observing. 
But one of the other things he discovered in the sky were holes, places where there seemed to be no stars. And here's a dramatic uh, bunch of these holes in the sky. Of course, we realize today that these are not holes in the sky. They're dark clouds. They're opaque regions. They're foreground to the stars in the background, and something is dimming the light, actually obscuring it completely in some cases. So this led to the discovery of what we call the dusty interstellar medium. Now, the interstellar medium is a hard vacuum. There's no doubt about that. Maybe one hydrogen atom per cubic meter. But in places, it becomes much more than that, 10, 100, or even 1,000 atoms per cubic meter. That's still a very hard vacuum. But about 1% of the volume of gas is in the form of tiny little grains, uh, kind of like particles of smoke. You know, you can wave smoke around, but you can't actually feel the grains. Whereas if you pick up some sand, you can feel grains of sand. They're bigger. Smoke particles are smaller. So that's very similar to the smoke particles that are in these dark clouds. They're extremely efficient at absorbing ordinary light. That's not the case for infrared light, however. So it turns out that Herschel in discovering these holes in the sky had discovered, in effect, the dirty, smog-like interstellar medium, and he had also discovered the means by which we could study it, infrared radiation. Unfortunately, we had to wait 175 years after Herschel for the technology to come that allowed us to take pictures in the infrared. So let me illustrate. Taking advantage of light you cannot see, here's a beautiful panorama in ordinary visible light of the Milky Way galaxy. And now you see from this vantage point, much of the sky here along the plane of the Milky Way is dark. It's got these dark holes. That's because there's a lot of gas and dust in those regions, and we're simply not seeing the light from beyond those regions. It's dimming it. Actually, if we look towards Sagittarius and the center of our galaxy, 26,000 light years away, with visible light, you see nothing. Well, you see something, but you're not seeing to the center of the galaxy. You're just seeing some foreground stars a few thousand light years away. Why is that? Because only one out of every 10 billion photons emitted from stars at the center of our galaxy actually makes it to here. On the other hand, if you could do this picture in the infrared, and this is not fake, this is a real all-sky infrared picture that we can do today, then it looks different. Let me just show it again. That's the visible light image, and here's the infrared image. Now we can see right through these dark clouds, and we can see indeed there is a lot of stuff at the center of the galaxy. It's very bright. So in fact, in the near-infrared light, that light that is just a little bit redder than red that Herschel discovered, one out of every 10 photons makes it all the way to the Earth. So that's remarkable. That's the wavelength that we need to study. So let me just summarize not just one, but four reasons why infrared is important. I just gave you one that infrared waves pass much more easily through interstellar gas and dust, these little smoke particles. And that's important because those dense regions of space are where new stars form. So if we want to understand star formation, we have to look inside those regions. But also objects that are just merely cold rather than super hot are actually brightest in the infrared. So for example, if you ever look at a gas flame on a gas stove, the blue part of the flame is the hottest part. The yellow part is actually cooler. And if, the, if you have an electric grill and you see a sort of red glow, that's even lower temperature. So the redder it looks, the cooler it is. Well, there are some objects that are so cool that the redness is in the infrared. And so to detect them, you have to take infrared pictures. For example, uh, very low mass stars, red dwarf stars, failed stars like brown dwarfs, and giant planets around other stars, exoplanets, are all best observed in the infrared. And also when the temperature gets colder than you would find in a normal star like the sun, then molecules can form. Molecules like 
water, H2O. Now, it's still pretty hot, so it's actually superheated steam rather than liquid water. But you can actually form that molecule and carbon monoxide and methane, CH4. If you want to prove that you've seen methane, for example, you need to take a spectrum in the infrared. You need to analyze the light with the spectrum in the infrared because that's where the signature of methane will show up, not invisible light. But here's the most important thing, and this was probably our primary motivation for building MOSFIRE, the expansion of the universe. Because the universe is expanding, that means the space between galaxies is increasing with time, and so those waves of light that are coming to us from distant galaxies are fighting against the expansion of the universe. That stretches those waves. If you stretch a wave, you make it longer. That means you make it redder. Well, some of the most distant galaxies are so far away that their ordinary visible light, when it reaches us, is infrared. So if you want to see what that galaxy looks like, you need to take a picture in the infrared. And we've understood that for a long time, and it's very important, and that's why we're doing this from the ground, but in the future we'll be doing it from space as well, because the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, the so-called James Webb Space Telescope, is actually an infrared telescope, and a big one in space. However, infrared is not that easy. It's actually quite challenging. And you can see why with this uh, picture here. Everything emits infrared radiation, including all of you. Uh, there's a light on me right now, but if we were to cut all the lights here, you wouldn't be able to see me and I wouldn't be able to see you. But we should hope that no snake makes its way into this uh, theater, because the snake would be able to see you, because it can detect your infrared heat signature. And you can see here the heat from someone's arm through this black bag. So on the left, you can't see through the black garbage bag at visible light, but in the infrared, you see clean through it. That's exactly like Herschel's holes in the sky. We can see through those holes to what's inside them. But this is a problem, because if we're warm and radiating infrared, then so is our telescope and so is the air that we're breathing, our, our own sky. So we have a huge foreground problem. Everything in the foreground not the distant universe, but in the foreground is actually a strong emitter of infrared. And so the infrared sky is simply not dark at night. It's actually quite bright. It glows. That's a pain in the neck. Uh, Earth's atmosphere blocks infrared light as well, except at certain wavelength ranges. This is the famous greenhouse effect. We want to see out, so we want that infrared light to be able to come through. Now, luckily, it does come through in certain ranges of colors, and we call those windows. We even give them names like blue, green, and red, like B, G, and R. We call it J, H, and K. They're just bands of colors that actually makes it through the atmosphere. And worse still, the infrared camera that we're going to try and build is going to be warm, and therefore it's going to glow, and so it's going to see itself. So we can't have any of those things. What we need to do is pump out all the air, put everything in a chamber, pump out all the air, and cool the whole thing down to cryogenic temperatures, like minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So we just took a simple problem, which is build a camera or build a spectrograph that works in infrared wavelengths, and we made it hard because we're going to have to do it all inside a vacuum chamber and everything we build has to be cooled to cryogenic temperatures without breaking. So that's tough. Infrared cameras and spectrographs are vacuum cryogenic systems, whereas for optical instruments, only the detector, the digital detector, is actually cryogenic. Here it's all cryogenic and that really makes it hard. But the reward is tremendous because, for example, this is a, a Hubble Space Telescope view of the Orion Nebula. You can see it's beautiful. It's beautiful because of all these rivulets of dust and gas. And nebula means cloud in Latin. But actually, this is what's going on. This is the equivalent infrared picture. You can see that the reality is actually quite different. Inside this cloud are young newborn stars, some literally like this one up here, named after my colleague, the Becklin-Neugebauer object, is only a few million years old. 
I know that sounds old to you, but in terms of the age of the sun, which is four and a half billion with a B, then a few million years old means it's absolute newborn. So we want to be able to study regions like this. And now, let me explain right away that I said you can't see the infrared, so how was I just able to show you an infrared picture? So what we have to do is visualize it. What we're doing here is taking three bands of color in the infrared, let's call them J, H, and K, and assigning them the colors blue, green, and red. And then in the computer, we make the picture look like it's blue, green, and red, but you you saw what the actual image looked like. It looked like that in blue, green, and red, real blue, green, and red. So this is a color translation. This is what your eyes might see if they were infrared sensitive instead of sensitive to ordinary visible light. Okay, here's another picture taken with uh, one of our infrared cameras. The visible light image is shown down on the right-hand corner. You can see it's very dark in the middle, and this is just a black and white picture. And here's our three-color translation again, where the three infrared wavelengths are blue, green, and red to give us an idea of what we would see if we had infrared eyes. And you see there's a lot of redness. So that means that it's mostly those very red infrared colors that are actually predominant here. And so we're seeing deep into this gas cloud. And it's a lovely picture. I, I wouldn't not want to be able to take pictures like this. But when I look at a picture like this, I say, hmm, I wonder what kind of object that is. And the only way to answer that question is to analyze the light chemically, spectroscopically, to take it and do what Isaac Newton did, spread it out into a spectrum and see what is in the spectrum. And if you take a look at this, this is fake, of course, this object is not, doesn't have that spectrum but this is a nice spectrum to show you. So here's a picture of the spectrum. There's what the visible light part would look like, and here's the entire infrared part visualized. And you can see that there are some regions that are very, very dark, and those are being absorbed. Now, that, most of that absorption right here that you're seeing, the signal drops right down, that's water actually superheated steam in the atmosphere of that object. It's a brown dwarf, a very, very cold brown dwarf star, failed star. But what's really interesting is that region right here, which looks curiously chopped up. If you look very carefully at that spectrum, we've actually seen it before. It's the spectrum of Jupiter. That shape is entirely due to methane. And objects like this were absolutely unknown until about 1995. Stellar objects, stellar-like sources that had a spectrum that looked like one of the giant planets, Jupiter. So that's the power of spectroscopy, and that's why we need to do it. Chemical composition, temperatures, densities, velocities, and much more. So we actually have an instrument that will do that. I delivered it to Keck back in 1999. That was a great project called NERSPEC, uh, the instrument was built from 94 and, uh, to 99, and it's still in operation today. And here's a slightly younger me standing beside it back in 1999. So why are we not satisfied with that? Well, we're not satisfied with that because that instrument does one thing and one thing only. It isolates an individual star or galaxy and provides the spectrum, and that's all doesn't take pictures, and it only does one object at a time. But distant objects are really faint, and sometimes the exposures can be incredibly long. Three hours is not unreasonable exposure. So this is just like opening the shutter, taking exposure, closing the shutter, and reading out the information. You don't really want to, if you have 30 galaxies to observe, and each one's gonna take three hours, that's a heck of a long time. Wouldn't it be nice if you could do those 30 galaxies all at the same time? Well, obviously, that increases your efficiency by uh, 30 times, a huge factor. But it's actually scientifically more productive to study an ensemble of objects anyway. So if you have a cluster of galaxies in the same area and they're all at the same distance, they're probably related. But you could at least study that by studying them all at the same time. 
So that's why we want to make a spectrometer that is multi-object, multi-object, MOS. Now, we've actually been able to do that for some time. We can do it uh, with our visible light spectrographs. They, they all have that feature. And basically, what we're trying to do is replicate that in the infrared. So here's our science requirements versus some technical considerations. We want a reasonable field of view on the sky. Six by six arc minutes is not bad. That's very similar to what we have with our optical visible light spectrographs. So that would be our goal. That would be this uh, red square here. And this is a real uh, image of the sky. It's actually shown as a negative. We do that quite often. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have a black background with the white white sources on it, but other times it's ple more pleasing to the eye to have a white background with the black sources, and that's as if you had a negative uh, film. So these are all digital detectors. There's no phot photography involved, but we still use ideas that came from photography. We also want to use the most state-of-the-art infrared digital imaging device, and those have about 4 million pixels right now, 4 megapixels. Uh, when I started, um, when I lived here in Hilo uh, with my wife and family back in 1986 to 89, when I was working for the Joint Astronomy Center, I designed and built one of the very first infrared cameras ever used anywhere on a large telescope, the 3.8 meter UK infrared telescope on Mauna Kea. And we had 3,596 pixels, so just under 4,000 pixels. So we've come a long way since 1986. Beautiful four megapixel detectors. And we want to get the highest possible spectral resolution that we can get. Everybody wants that. The better the spectrum, the more detail you can get. How many objects should we try and get? Well, we had a committee look at this for us, a scientific committee, and they said, don't build this unless you can get 15 to 20 objects. That's 15 to 20 little slits to isolate those objects. So that was our goal, going in 15 to 20 objects. Uh, astronomers like incredible stability and repeatability. They want to be able to go back to the settings that they had before and know that they're exactly what they had before. That's a tall order for engineering, but we built that into it as well. Excellent stability and repeatability. And of course, astronomers want not a single photon lost or wasted, so achieve the best possible sensitivity for faint object spectroscopy. Most important of all, the condition was avoid the classic method of getting these spectra. How, what is the classic method? Well, the classic method is to know, to take a picture first, know what objects you're interested in, and then make a metal mask. So you have a piece of aluminum, and you actually have a mill drill little slats in it, just like it's been shown here. And so you have a metal plate with the pattern of objects for that particular field of, of the sky, and you put that in your instrument, line it up, and then allow the light to pass through. Of course, if you go to another field, you need another mask. If you go to yet another field, you need another mask. So you need as many masks as there are fields that you're interested in as astronomers who want to use them. The aluminum plates have to be milled ahead of time. And you remember I said in an infrared instrument, everything has to be cold inside a vacuum chamber. So to change these masks, you need to warm up the whole instrument open the chamber to air, change the mask, cool it all back down again. Virtually impossible. It hadn't been done before, except by that really laborious way of doing it. And so the goal was to avoid those thermal cycles and figure out how to do this. So how do you do this? So we heard about a remarkable device that was being developed by the Swiss Center for Electronics and Microtechnology for the James Webb Space Telescope. It turns out that it wasn't selected for the James Webb Space Telescope. They decided to go with a different technology, a technology which hasn't yet panned out. So it, they might have been better going with the Swiss technology. Anyway, we turned to the Swiss and said, this sounds interesting, why don't you make this for us? And we started working with them. 
So what is it? It's called a configurable slit unit, and it's very easy to understand if you just look at my fingers and think of two bars, long bars that approach each other and stop to make a little gap. That's the slit, just like Newton's slit in his uh, window blind. But you have lots of these bars, and they can go anywhere in a line like this to produce a slit, and then they're quantized. You can have lots of them stacked, one on top of the other. In fact, we came up with uh, 92 bars, so that's 46 pairs. So we, you remember the requirement was 15 to 20 of these slitlets to get objects? We can get up to 46. So pairs of opposing bars are configured under computer control. So this all happens inside the vacuum chamber. You don't have to warm up or cool down anything. So this took some time to design and develop, because you remember that requirement about repeatability and stability? That was got to be factored in here. These are long bars to cover the whole field of view. The field of view that we're talking about, six arc minutes, it's about a quarter of a meter on a side. So those are large bars, and you can see the kinds of patterns that you can make, narrow slits, wider slits, boxes on slits. These boxes turn out to be useful because that's how we find the objects in the first place and align the whole mask so we know that we're looking at the right field. So here's a, a, a point uh, sometime around uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, that's me uh, in Switzerland with the vendor uh, as they start to make all these parts. And they came up with a very interesting uh, approach and it's illustrated here. Do you know what this is? It's an uh, inchworm. So it's the inchworm principle. That's how this uh, thing works. It's too complicated to explain to you in detail right now. But basically, the way these bars move is that each of them has a little sawtooth pattern on it, like this. And a little ruby tip is engaged into it and pulls the bar a little bit. And then you apply a brake and it lifts and it moves forward and goes down. You release the brake, pulls again, apply the brake, lift, move forward, down. So that's the inch one principle, where you just move a very little amount, just the body length of the inchworm, and yet you make progress, slowly but surely. So that's how it works. So that solved one problem. But we still needed the optics. This is the optical design. It's a little bit complicated. But all I wanted to show you was that the light from the telescope comes to a focus. And then we do something quite deliberate. We have some lenses here which make the beam parallel. So that diverging beam stops diverging as it goes through these lenses, becomes parallel. That allows us to pass the light easily through colored filters that separate out certain colors in the infrared, and then hit a diffraction grating. Diffraction grating is the equivalent of a glass prism, and that spreads the light out into its component colors. And then we have camera lenses that re-image it onto the infrared detector, which is a digital infrared camera. I'll just draw your attention to this mirror here. This mirror just looks like it's not doing much except changing the direction of the beam. But actually, it's a very subtle mirror. That mirror can be tipped and tilted by just tiny amounts. And you'll see why in a moment. What was difficult about this design? Well, everything was big. Everything had to work at cryogenic temperatures. And the one thing that you can do to glass when you cool it down is break it. Just try putting a glass into your freezer and freezing it too rapidly, and it would just shatter. So we had to control the rate at which things was be were being cooled, but we also had to make sure that everything shrunk by just the right amount that it would actually work when it got cold. So that means you have to design it sort of incorrectly. It has to be manufactured at room temperature. And so it doesn't really work at room temperature, but when you cool everything down, it works just right. That is really difficult. In fact, we didn't know some of the refractive indices um, of these glasses. And so we actually had to do classical physics experiments with little prisms to figure out what the bending power of those glasses was at the temperature we were interested in. That work was actually done by my colleague, uh, Harlan Epps, professor at the University of Santa Cruz in California, and that's him shown there. And this is the inside 
what I showed you was a concept of the optics, and this is a computer-aided drawing, a mechanical drawing showing how it was actually implemented. Here are the slits here, and there are how all the lenses, and that fold mirror that has the little tipping and tilting capability, it's a little hexapod, um, that's there too. And here's some of our guys in the lab, uh, a Caltech technician and a UCLA technician actually holding one of the big lenses that are about to be assembled and cooled down. It was actually quite tricky to put these things together, and just in the interest of time, I'll just show you pictures and not explain exactly how we did it. It was difficult, but we did it. And here's the assembled, this is like a big Nikon camera lens, except it wasn't made by Nikon, it was made by us. And there's the big camera lens right there being lowered into MOSFIRE. This is another one of the lenses being lowered in. People, when they see this, say, oh, is that kind of cloudy because it's an infrared transmitting glass or something like that. And I said, no, no, it's actually made of calcium fluoride. It's actually completely transparent. But we were so paranoid that we might drop a screw or something on it that we actually have perspex on top of it. So that's why it looks a little bit cloudy. We have a protective cover over it. So here's some of the mirrors going in. This one is, uh, this is the diffraction grading and the diffraction grading is actually gold-coated because that works really well in the infrared. Uh, this mirror here, a plain mirror, this is the one that tips and tilts a little bit, and uh, it's coated with silver. So you see all the tricks that we were doing, we're getting really good uh, efficiency in getting all the light through just like the astronomers want. So here's the instrument at a late stage in its construction. Everything is inside the large blue painted vacuum chamber. Uh, this is the front side, of course the big bell-shaped cover on the front has been removed so you can see it. And this is the back side and this is where all the electronics that operate everything, the computers and so on, are all located and the doors are open uh, so you can see what it looks like if someone's sitting there beside it, kind of for scale. So this brings me up to February 3rd, 2012, packing day. It was a Friday. And so here's MOSFIRE getting uh, lifted by a crane off of its uh, handling cart. Uh, sorry, lifted onto its handling cart, lowered down onto the cart. And then the whole thing is lifted by the crane and carried high above all the other experiments in the lab. That was a very scary moment. If something had gone wrong at that moment, it would all have been over. So you can see this is about five tons here, five metric tons. Luckily, the crane was rated for 20 tons, so it was fine. So it ended up over at the door, and a professional packing company was hired to encapsulate the whole thing in a sort of waterproof uh, seal, and the air was pumped out, and then the whole thing was put in a large box, and off the box went. So here's my colleague, Chuck Seidel, myself in front of the instrument. Here's the whole team. Uh, or most of the team that could be present that day standing in front of the box. And here's Monday morning, 9 a.m., February the 6th. The huge crate pulls out of the uh, lab on its way to the port of San Diego for its journey across the ocean to Hawaii. And here we are uh, in Hawaii, February 16th. Police escort from Hilo <laughs> all the way up to the summit. Uh, on the summit, forklift driver takes the large box off, and we discover something that we didn't anticipate. The box won't go through the door. <laughs> so we had to cut open the box, <laughs> and it just so happens that the, with the forklift as low as it can go, the actual instrument did go through the door, and so safely on the inside. And by that time, it was in Mark's hands and the other folks at uh, WM Keck Observatory. And then a crane lifted it from the floor up onto the uh, platform. And there I am standing in front of the instrument on the platform. And if I get behind the instrument, as you can see on the right-hand side, you can see it's looking at the telescope. That's where it's going to go. That's called the Cassegrain focus of the telescope. So that's the sort of direct path. The light comes in, hits the primary, up to the secondary, and then straight down into the instrument. And when MOSFIRE's in there, it's the instrument. 
So now we jump to the 4th of April uh, 2012, and this was our first light, first night on the telescope. So this is the first time light actually went through the telescope and the instrument together. And here's our first target. It's just some suitable star that wasn't too bright to sharpen up the focus. And you might notice here that it says April 5th. And so why did I say April 4th? That's universal time. So it was April 5th on the Greenwich Meridian, but it was still April 4th here in Hawaii. So after we got focus, we went to our first light target. And of course, we didn't do this randomly. We had thought about this target for, uh, long before. And we chose two galaxies in collision. They're called the antennae. And they have hit each other and merged. And by the way, something like that is going to happen to the Milky Way and Andromeda. The Andromeda galaxy is a huge spiral galaxy just like the Milky Way. It's only two and a half million light years away only. And it's on a collision course with the Milky Way. Don't worry. It's two to three billion years before that will happen. Uh, so nothing we have to plan for today. Not that our politicians could think that far ahead anyway. But people are often concerned that, you know, does that mean some star will collide with us and hit us? Uh, very unlikely. Stars form a, a, a system, a dynamical system that is collisionless. They will almost never hit each other. And that's because stars are so small compared to the distance between them. But what does happen is that the hydrogen gas and that dust stuff, that is everywhere, and that gets compressed in the collision, and that stimulates the formation of new stars. And here's the picture that's on the cover. Um, I have a better one uh, later, a larger one later. But this shows three infrared wavelengths. This is one of these color translations. So it's like blue, green, and red for the infrared, J, H, and K. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's a whole bunch of little red things here. And you'll see it better uh, later when I show a larger picture. Those are star forming regions. They weren't there before. They just happened because of the collision of the two galaxies. So lots of new stars start to form. So here's the image I was talking about. So things that are red here are absolutely invisible to your eye because they're embedded. They're like the Orion star cloud. They're embedded in gas and dust. And so the only way to even see them is to take an infrared picture. So those are forming, star forming regions that are occurring because of this collision. OK, now I made that look easy, but it turns out that it's not so easy. If you just take an ordinary infrared picture of the sky, it might look like that. And this is a real picture. This is actual data from the camera. Remember, the camera is digital. So every brightness, the brightness of every pixel is recorded in the computer as a number. And you can manipulate that number for each pixel. So typically, this is the field of view that you see. And you can see that there are some things in there. But that foreground emission that I was talking about, that's swamping it. It's causing a poor contrast. So there's a couple of things we can do. What we can do is move the image around a little bit and take it over and over again, and then move them together in the computer afterwards. We do a trick called a median filter, and the stars disappear. And then we can use that as the background signal and subtract it off, and the picture looks like that. And we actually do that in real time at the telescope as the telescope is moving around and taking picture after picture. We were actually interested in uh, that object there. Uh, this galaxy just happened to get in the way. <laughs> Another thing that you can do if you want to uh, act a little bit more quickly is to just take one image and then move the telescope a little bit, take a second image, and have the computer take the difference between the two images. Remember, it's doing that arithmetic digitally. For every single pixel in the two images, it has numbers. And it just subtracts those two numbers and gives you a second picture. So here's another example. This is the famous ring nebula in Lyra, uh, M57. And we took the picture, and then we moved the telescope. We took the picture again and took the difference. So if you take the difference, you see the object twice, once uh, positive and once negative. The reason I wanted to show you this one is that we happened to hit a night of absolutely beautiful seeing. Basically, the seeing was about 0.3 seconds of arc, two pixels on the detector. 
So if you know any of your astronomy, uh, 0.3 seconds of arc is very, very good seeing. And this is infrared. Uh, the image quality is great, you know, right to the edge of the field. The images look fantastic, and then you're at the edge of the field. Uh, here's an example of sensitivity. Uh, if you look at this object here, uh, this one too, but this object on the upper left, you can see there's a little black dot near the center. That indicates that that target saturated on the detector, so it's too bright. And it's 13th and a half magnitude, 13.5 magnitude, too bright for MOS fire on Keck. We need to be looking at things like this one here, which is 21st magnitude, and that's what we were actually after. That's just a five minute exposure, nothing more than that. So very easy. Sensitivity is just as expected. And in fact, uh, we hammered that home with this plot that we showed to our uh, uh, science steering committee. And what this actually shows in uh, black is the predicted measurements, what we should get for the transmission of the instrument at all these infrared wavelengths. And red is actually measured. They look identical. It looks like we faked it. But luckily, luckily, we published the prediction before we made the measurements. And you might say, well, how does this uh, MOSFIRE instrument compare with NERSPEC? It should be able to do the same thing if you take a, a spectrum of the same object. And so we did that. We compared them. And as you expect, it looks identical. Now, when I first show this to somebody, they say, hmm, that's kind of a ratty looking spectrum, isn't it? And I said, well, why do you say that? You expected it to be all nice and smooth, did you? And they would say, Yes, of course. And I said, yeah, you're forgetting that this object is very cool. It's only about 1,100 degrees, which means that water vapor and methane can form in its atmosphere. And that is the spectrum of methane. All these lines going up and down are absolutely real. This is a really good measurement of the spectrum of methane in that object. And this dip here is due to superheated steam. So MOSFIRE and NERSPEC agree, they give the same answer, but MOSFIRE had a slightly better resolving power and it got there faster. 900 seconds for NERSPEC and uh, 600 seconds for MOSFIRE. I'm very proud of both those instruments. Uh, let me show you this. I'm running out of time, so I don't want to uh, uh, run over. But here's some more of these very strange, cool objects known as brown dwarfs. And you can see they're not all the same. In fact, they have classifications, T2, T5, and T8. What is that? It's just temperature. And the temperature is changing and getting cooler and cooler from you know, something like 1,500 degrees down to something closer to 500 degrees. So really cool stellar-like objects, but they're not stars. They're failed stars. Now, we've been searching for some of these uh, for some time, and we'd like to try and find the really coolest of them. And once they get very, very far away and very faint, it's hard to find them by spectroscopy. It would be better if you could figure out an imaging method of finding them. And that's illustrated here. We purchased a filter that would integrate all of the light from that half of the spectrum and a second filter, H2, that would integrate all of the light from this half of the spectrum. So you can see that if you have one of these objects, there's almost no light in that half of the spectrum. And so if you look at an object, and here is one, it should disappear in that second filter. So one of my students, uh, Sarah Logston, uh, reduced this image. I should have acknowledged my other student, uh, Greg Mace, for this image here. And you can see that there's the object in H1 filter, and it's gone in H2. So if you survey and you find things dropping out of the H2 filter, you know almost certainly that you have discovered something is very, very low temperature, probably has methane absorption. It's probably a sort of free-floating Jupiter out there. Um, very, very cool brown dwarf object. Okay, a typical application, however, is not to look for these relatively cool nearby objects, is to look at the high redshift universe. So the way we do this is we, we take a picture, we make a star catalog, and we design a mask. And here is our software for doing that. So you see the objects that you've selected, where the mask is gonna be. You see what the spectrum is gonna look like before you even take it. 
You then go to the telescope. Since the mask is a digital image in the computer, the telescope knows the center of your field. So it just goes to the digitized sky survey. And this is a nice tool written by Mark Cassis and Greg Wirth, who are in the audience over here. Thank you, guys. Good job on this one. And you can see that what it does is that we take a picture, we recall a picture of the digitized sky survey, and then we compare that to a picture that we take with our own guide camera. And of course, that will be off just a little bit. So we just click on one of the objects and say, move it. And so the telescope moves a little bit until the two images coincide. We say, good, let's take a picture now through the slip mask with the real instrument, the MOSFET instrument. And so stars start to show up in the slip mask. And we can actually see them as they show up in individual slip masks and make sure that they're dead center with this little tool right here. And when we're good to go, then we can start taking a spectrum. But we have a big advantage here over the classical way of doing this, which is still the way that it's done at visible light as well. The alignment boxes, the so-called star boxes, are always big, fat boxes. And if you've cut a hole in a piece of metal, there's nothing you can do about it. But here, we have bars that open and close. So when we no longer need the box for star alignment, we just close it down and it becomes one of the regular slits. And so we can get back the boxes that we use for alignment. And the way we typically do this is that just because of this foreground always troubling us, making our contrast poor, we, we position the star at the center of the slit, individual slit, but we don't actually observe it there. We immediately move it up or down and we just keep doing that back and forth. We call it nodding to make interleaved exposures. And every pair, call it A and B, we subtract them digitally. And so we have a difference image. And then we just keep adding and adding and adding those difference images. And it's very effective at taking out that background. So here is some, um, a whole bunch of slits. And these vertical lines come from emission from the Earth's atmosphere. It's due to OH emission, the actual O and H, oxygen and hydrogen, cause this, even at night time. And here's a very good difference. So you see you have a positive signal and a negative signal, just like we had with the ring nebula. But when you take the difference, all that foreground disappears. So we can do this for very, very faint, distant objects. And here's an example of what we see. Now, when we saw this, we were really excited. You're not excited by seeing this, just not, not yet. But when you realize that these little blobs here, uh, positive and negative there because of the difference, that's hydrogen. That's hydrogen that is glowing in a distant galaxy because stars are forming there. It's the compression of that gas that is forming stars. But these objects are far, far away. They're redshifted to a redshift of 2.4 to 2.5. So what does that jargon mean? We need to look at some balloons. So here's a balloon that represents the universe. And the balloon is blowing up because the universe is expanding. And what you see is that the waves that represent the light as the universe expands get stretched. A longer wavelength is redder light. So you can actually relate the new wavelength to the original wavelength by a scale factor which is called z. It's the size, the relative size of the universe. And z is something we can measure. It's just the shift of that H alpha spectral line from where it should appear in the laboratory to where we actually see it. So for example, H alpha has a wavelength of 0.6563 microns. That's just a measurement that you can make in the laboratory. But at a redshift of 2, that shows up at a wavelength of 1.9689 microns. That's way into the infrared. So that's why it's showing up in our infrared cameras. And what does Z equals 2 mean? It means that you're seeing light from an object that left that object to begin its journey to us when the universe was one third. Remember, it's 1 plus Z, one third its current size. That means that the light has traveled for 
billion years, giga years. Or you're looking at the universe, you're looking back in time, and you're seeing a picture of the universe when it was only 3.34 billion years old, younger than the sun is now. Uh, we can do this in any field now. We can take deep infrared images at these infrared colors called J and K. We can select our targets up to 46 at a time. We can get right down to 25th magnitude, and we can get the spectrum of all of those galaxies. Here's one hour's worth of work on the Keck telescopes, and all sorts of stuff shows up. I just want to finish by drawing your attention to this one right here. This says it's a redshift of 3.356. That means a look-back time of 11.7 billion years. That's 2 billion years, roughly, after the Big Bang. We're seeing light from an object that started its journey just 2 billion years after the Big Bang. And what is it that we're actually looking at in this case is not hydrogen. Hydrogen would be interesting, but there's been hydrogen since the beginning of the Big Bang. That's oxygen. Oxygen. <laughs> the stuff that we are breathing right now. Oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, all of the elements heavier than helium were all made by stars in the first st galaxies that formed a few billion years after the Big Bang. And so this is the kind of instrument that you need to look all that way back in time and to study and try and understand the rate at which stars are forming because that will tell us about the abundance of elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So, it's uh, almost time, and I, I was told that the film would run out, so I better uh, end right now with my conclusions. So, many challenging issues solved. The cryogenic configurable slip mask avoids the need to make these prefabricated metal masks, and it certainly eliminates the very risky thermal cycles needed to install such metal masks. We got outstanding optics with exceptional transmission. We got a beautiful uh, digital imaging device. And that tip tilt mirror that I was telling you about, that compensates for just tiny bending of the instrument that you get. We got great stability and repeatability of all the mechanisms inside, everything working smoothly. And so the performance is indeed as good as expected. So I would say MOSFAR has fulfilled its promise, but it wouldn't have been possible without the help of all of those members of our team, uh, our universities, the Telescope System Instrumentation Program, and of course, a donation from Gordon and Betty Moore. Thank you all. Thank you. By the way, if you want to know more, there just happens to be quite a readable book that's uh, available at Amazon.com. <laughs>Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you for all you're doing to keep Keck Observatory in the forefront of astronomical discovery.